Thomas Edison called it his baby. Its development ruined friendships, created empires, and challenged the minds of America's most prolific and competitive inventors. Now, the invention that would bring opera to the parlors of the working man, the phonograph. Milan, Ohio, 1847. Here on February 11th, Thomas Alva Edison is born. Al, as he's called, is a bright little boy, a late life child who will remain deeply attached to his kind and understanding mother. From his father, Edison inherits a restless mind and an enduring zest for life. As dramatized in an early silent film at age six, Edison is full of questions. Like how can a baby goose come out of an egg? His father explains, but answers only set the boy thinking and experimenting. This experiment is fairly harmless, but ever since Al accidentally burned down the family barn, his parents tried to keep a watchful eye. Later in Port Huron, Michigan, where the family moves, some experiments are more like pranks. But when he's 11, young Edison is often in the family cellar experimenting with chemicals instead of studying at school. Tom, as he's now known, had been to school, but the teacher said he was inattentive, possibly stupid. His mother pulled him out after only three months and Thomas Edison never went to school again. When he is 12, Tom becomes a newsboy on the Grand Trunk Railroad, which connects Port Huron with nearby Detroit. He's not content with selling other people's papers, however, so he sets up a press and writes and prints his own newspaper. He also brings a few chemicals on board and accidentally causes a fire. According to legend, the conductor's beating leaves the boy near deaf. But more likely, Edison's hearing loss results from an early case of scarlet fever, or even from birth. There would be no more experimenting on the Grand Trunk Line, but Edison would soon be back selling newspapers again. One day during a stop at the St. Clemens station, Tom notices the station master's little boy and a runaway car heading his way. As a reward, the boy's father offers to teach Tom telegraphy. Unaware that he's been studying the subject and even built a few telegraphic instruments on his own. Tom eagerly accepts the offer and begins hands-on training. It will prove to be the first and possibly the most important decision in his life. The nation is in the midst of a great civil war when 16-year-old Tom Edison lands his first job as a Western Union telegrapher. For four years, he wanders from one station to the next, but he spends so much time reading about telegraphy and dreaming up ways to improve it that he often finds himself out of work with no clear plans for the future. So it was in 1868. While other restless young men are heading west to seek their fates and fortunes, Edison decides to go in the opposite direction, his destination, Boston. When Edison came to Boston, he was coming to one of the key innovation centers in America at that time. Uh, not only was it an important area in terms of telegraphy, uh, second only to New York, but more importantly, it was the center of a machine shop culture. And it's, this is what he found there. He found uh, skilled machinists who were uh, able to take inventions uh, turn them into working artifacts that then he could continue to uh, play with until he got them right. While supporting himself as a nighttime telegrapher, Edison usually spends his days at Charles Williams' machine shop, working on ideas for inventions. Within a few months, Edison files his first patent for an electric vote recorder. It will be the forerunner of modern voting machines, but not yet. It was refused by Congress overwhelmingly. This defeated what they were in Washington to do. They wanted to filibuster. With an electronic vote counter, there was no reason for this. Edison was horribly disappointed and vowed that as a result of this fiasco, he would only invent products for which there was a market. 
If he couldn't sell it, he was not going to invent it. Penniless, but optimistic as always, Edison informs fellow telegraphers that he is now a full-time inventor. And he heads for New York where he hooks up with a noted electrical engineer, Frank Polk. Polk likes the budding inventor and provides him with a home, introductions to investors and work, manufacturing and inventing telegraphic devices. The first invention that really pays off is a stock printer that will revolutionize Wall Street. To collect his pay, Edison goes to Western Union's lavish New York headquarters where he picks up a check for $30,000. Within a month, the money is gone. Most of it to equip a new factory and laboratory in Newark, New Jersey. It's a big operation, and overseeing it all is 24-year-old Thomas Alva Edison. Before long, there's another big change. On Christmas Day, 1871, Edison marries Mary Stilwell, a pretty young woman known for her fetching figure and her friendly disposition. After a brief honeymoon, Mary tries to become a proper 19th century housewife, while her husband eagerly returns to his lab and his first true love, working up inventions. When he is not yet 30, Edison has a steady income and a measure of fame, but he feels restless. And in 1876, he decides to move 12 miles south to a quiet country place called Menlo Park. Edison needed a place where he could both be separated from but connected to the rest of the world. And a place like Menlo Park filled the bill perfectly. He was setting himself up not as a manufacturer but as a professional change maker, making a living as an inventor. In Menlo Park, Edison buys a large house for his family, which now includes a daughter and son, Marion and Tom Jr., who the former telegrapher nicknames Dot and Dash. For the single men, there's a boarding house. Just a few steps away is the office and library. And just beyond that is the laboratory, the heart of Edison's small communal village. With generous financing, mostly from Western Union, and with the best supplies and tools at hand, Edison and his team set to work on several projects in the summer of 1876. One is a repeating telegraph, a device to record an incoming message on a disk, then repeat it to the next station down the line. At the same time, Edison's also working on a new transmitter for the telephone, recently invented by Alexander Graham Bell. Somewhat envious because Bell invented the telephone before he could, Edison now wants to solve Bell's main problem. The voices can barely be heard. On the night of July 18, 1877, while Edison and his boys are in the lab testing a diaphragm from the telephone transmitter, Edison makes a momentous discovery. He was playing in the laboratory one night, and as they were playing with the diaphragm, he put his finger under it and realized that there was enough movement there that he might be able to uh, cause an impression in a piece of wax paper or something else that would allow him to, in a sense, uh, repeat the message to play it uh, once it was recorded, to play it back so it could continue over the line. That night, Edison scribbles in his notebook, there is no doubt that I shall be able to store up and reproduce automatically at any future time the human voice. Full of confidence, Edison thinks he will now invent a kind of telephone answering and repeating machine. But he's actually about to invent something far more original and revolutionary. The world's first phonograph. The path from idea to invention is rarely straight or smooth, even at Thomas Edison's invention factory in 1877. When Edison starts thinking about a phonograph, he knows that he won't be the first to record sound. A Frenchman named Léon Scott de Martinby had already done that 20 years before on a machine he called the phonautograph. What Edison doesn't know, however, is that another Frenchman, Charles Crow, had recently written a paper describing a way to play back sound as well as record it. But what Crow only conceives, Thomas Edison will achieve with a little help from Charles Batchelor, a British-born draftsman mechanic and problem solver. 
and John Cruzy, a Swiss-born master machinist. Even with help, work on the phonograph begins very slowly. In fact, the word phonograph doesn't appear in Edison's notes until one month after he reached the conclusion that he could record in playback sound. In another two weeks, Edison reaches another important turning point. On September 7th, he sits down and draws up what's essentially a, a list of possible things he can do with the phonograph. They're all things that we'd be familiar with today, uh, but uh, this uh, marks the beginning of the phonograph as a completely separate uh, technology. Two months later, Scientific American announces that Mr. Edison has a wonderful new invention for a talking machine. It's a deliberate press leak written at Menlo Park by a close member of the Edison team. But so far, there is no phonograph, not even a sketch of what it will be in its final form. On December 3rd, Edison considers three different formats, tape, disc, and cylinder before making a final decision. 50 years later, he would recall. I designed my original tinfoil phonograph in cylinder form and gave it to my faithful John Cruzy to make. He made fun of it. Whether Cruzy made fun of Edison's drawing or not, he takes it and goes to work. On December 6th, he sends word to the boss that his new invention is finished and ready for a test. In 1927, on the golden anniversary of the phonograph, Edison remembers what he said. The uh, first words I spoke in the original phonograph, a uh, little piece of practical poetry. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. <laughs> To everyone's surprise, Edison's words came back just as he'd spoken them on the very first try. Edison later said he was never so taken aback in all his life, but for now, he can't wait to spread the news. On the very next day, Edison takes the phonograph to the New York office of Scientific American for the first public premiere. The event is a sensation. I mean, if you read the articles in Scientific American, for example, that announced the discovery of the phonograph, you're struck over and over and over again by the amazement. All of a sudden, you can record your voice and play it back at any time, now, 50 years from now, a century from now. They were astounded by being able to do that, but they were also astounded by something else, that the apparatus was so basically simple. Edison's tinfoil phonograph is mechanically very simple and its operation is quite easy to understand. To make a recording, a person speaks into a horn which directs sound waves towards a thin metal diaphragm. When the sound waves strike the diaphragm, they cause it to vibrate. And as the diaphragm vibrates, it also vibrates an attached needle. As the cylinder rotates, the needle makes indentations in a thin piece of tinfoil. To play back the recording, the process is simply reversed, in this case using a separate diaphragm and needle. By following the indentations, the needle and diaphragm vibrate, sending the same sound waves back again. Although the phonograph is very simple, at first many people think it must be magic. It isn't long before Edison has a new title the Wizard of Menlo Park. He's an international celebrity, and everyone wants to see and hear his magical machine. In April, the Wizard takes a new demonstration model to Washington to show members of Congress and the Patents Committee. Later that night, he's invited to come to the White House. President Hayes is so thrilled with Edison's invention that he wakes up his wife so she too can record and listen to her voice. It's 3.30 in the morning before the First Lady bids Edison good night. Before leaving Washington, Edison has his image and his photographs taken at the studios of noted Civil War photographer Matthew Brady. A second photo is taken. The man on the left is Uriah Painter, one of a group of investors who buy the rights to exhibit Edison's machine. By the summer of 1878, however, public interest in the phonograph is fading and so is Edison's. 
In October, he suddenly abandons all work on the one invention that he will always call his baby. I think it's very interesting because it was more his baby than his own kids who were his babies at the time. He spent more time with his baby machine than he did with his baby kids, all of them, three of them at the time. And um, he nurtured that to a certain point, like you would with a real baby. And then just like he did with his own kids, he totally turned his back on it because he got bored. He wanted to do something different and exercise his imagination more uh, creatively. Edison's new passion is electricity and inventing the incandescent light bulb and bringing light to people's homes and streets and industries will be his consuming passion for almost 10 years. Then, in 1881, after three years as a virtual orphan, Edison's baby is taken in by Alexander Graham Bell. Well, Alexander Graham Bell, when he heard about the phonograph, was astounded that he hadn't thought of it. So after Edison had given it up, uh, Gardner Hubbard, who was one of the leading principals of the Edison Speaking Phonograph Company and also Bell's father-in-law, uh, pushed him into working on this, this device and trying to make it a practical instrument so that in fact they could exploit it. With prize money awarded by the French government, Bell sets up a new lab in Washington. He assigns the task for improving Edison's phonograph to his cousin, Chester Bell, a chemist, and Charles Tainter, a scientist and instrument maker. Working in secret, Tainter and Bell produce the graphophone. One key improvement is that the recording surface is wax-covered cardboard instead of tinfoil, which could only be played two or three times. The hand crank is also gone, replaced by a motor typically driven by a foot treadle. Recognizing that the graphophone is really a set of improvements on Edison's invention, Bell suggests that they pool their patents and join forces. Edison is furious. He says, under no circumstances will I do business with Alexander Graham Bell or his pirates. Instead, he resolves to rescue his baby and make a new and better phonograph. And most important, a finely engineered machine that will bear the name of the original inventor, the wizard, Thomas Alva Edison. In 1886, when Thomas Edison decides to reclaim the phonograph, the one most associated with his name was still in the future. And when he starts thinking about his favorite invention, he's too involved with other matters to give it personal attention. One matter is Edison's decision to leave Menlo Park. He'd spent little time here over the past eight years while working on electricity and he's already started building a much larger laboratory, office, and factory complex in West Orange, New Jersey. Another matter is that Edison has recently taken a new wife, 20-year-old Mina Miller. His reason for remarrying is not divorce. His first wife, Mary, had suddenly died from a brain tumor almost two years before at age 29. Unlike Mary, Mina comes from a distinguished and wealthy family. So when the couple move into Glenmont, their elegant new estate in West Orange, Mina is as prepared as she can be to become the wife of a famous, if often neglectful, husband. On his honeymoon, Edison scribbles a few ideas about improving the phonograph. But since he's still deeply involved with electrical concerns, he hands responsibility for the phonograph to others especially Ezra Gilliland, an old telegrapher buddy, fellow inventor, employee, and the closest friend Edison would ever have. You know, they were known as Damon and Pythias. That's how close they really were. And they grew up together, and they were friends in young adulthood, and Gilliland helped introduce Edison to his second wife, which is a very crucial thing. In fact, Edison and Gilliland were so close, they built side-by-side -side winter homes in Fort Myers, Florida. Edison drew up the plans. But to Gilliland's dismay after working on the phonograph off and on for more than a year, in late 1887, Edison suddenly decides that he's taking control. While his friend quietly seethes, Edison throws himself full force into perfecting his baby. One reason for his decision is that the Bell Tainter graphophone has recently been introduced as a dictating machine. 
and getting the kind of press that Edison loves. He knows the time to catch up is now or never. Catching up requires a massive effort and eight long months. But on June 16, 1888, after a legendary final 72 hours of work, the perfected phonograph is finished. At 5.30 that morning, according to legend, he has this picture taken. It's the most famous photo of Thomas Edison, but what a different image from the young inventor of 10 years before. Edison undoubtedly does feel weary, but the pose is calculated to present a new image. Mr. Edison is the Napoleon of invention. He likes the image so well he hangs a color version in his office. And what has this Napoleon achieved? The recording surface is now a wax cylinder instead of tinfoil, an idea stolen from Bell and Tainter. But Edison has a far better compound, and the wax can be shaved and reused hundreds of times. With a work of invention finished, Edison sells rights to exploit the phonograph for $500,000. He asks his trusted friend Ezra Gilliland to handle negotiations. It's a fateful decision because Gilliland negotiates a secret deal with the buyer, allowing him to collect $250,000, half of what Edison will get. When Edison learns of this secret agreement, he feels utterly betrayed. The friendship is over. While deeply hurt, Edison is resilient and optimistic about the future. He gears up to produce 200 phonographs a day, he thinks his invention will be mainly used as a dictating machine in offices. But his first big order is for something less practical, tiny phonographs for talking dolls. With an imported bisque head and lifelike hair, the doll is quite beautiful. However, there are a few problems. The mechanism was really too fragile to be used inside a child's toy. The records were very soft, made of a brown wax material. Any kind of bumping or jarring would break the record, and the records were not replaceable by the doll owner. In addition, the sharp stylus that was used on the record would only allow one, two, three plays, perhaps maximum, before the stylus actually cut through the record and made the record unusable. Another problem is the quality of the recordings. Edison would later say that he found the voices of the little monsters exceedingly unpleasant to hear. With little progress in solving these problems, Edison will give up and never make talking dolls again. No matter. By 1890, the phonograph has already found a home in concert halls where people gathered to hear their favorite tunes. Sing-alongs were also popular. But the most popular and profitable use of the phonograph isn't in churches. It's in phonograph parlors and penny arcades, in hotel lobbies and train stations. By dropping a nickel into the slot and using the listening tubes, people can hear a rousing Sousa march, a Stephen Foster song, or a bit of 19th century humor. The popularity of coin and slot phonographs keeps Edison's factory humming. Coin machines also boost the fortunes of the Columbia Graphophone Company, for now Edison's only rival. And one message both companies repeatedly hear is make more records. The phonograph creates thousands of new jobs and gives birth to a new industry, music recording. But the process is unbelievably primitive. With no way yet to mass produce records, at first every cylinder is an original. Performers must sing the same song or play the same tune over and over. 
Sometimes it's possible to record on several machines, but what kind of records are being made? Mostly marches, minstrel songs, instrumental solos and sugar sweet songs like Edison's favorite. I'll take you home again, Kathleen. What you really have here is somebody with very, very traditional pedestrian, or shall we say middle of the road tastes, that he believed this was what the rest of the American public had an obligation to uh, attend to, which was coming from Thomas Edison in his role as setting the tone, as it were, for what people should listen to in their homes. And if it was good enough for him, it was good enough for everybody else. In fact, in 1893, most phonographs are still in recital halls and penny arcades, and very few are in private homes. But the first home phonographs are not far away. In the mid-1890s, the latest novelty is motion pictures, and Thomas Edison is too busy developing motion picture equipment and making movies to pay much attention to the phonograph. But revolutionary changes are underway. One is that Columbia introduces the first graphophone designed for the home market. And what makes this machine possible is a new spring motor that results in a relatively lightweight and affordable machine priced at $75. Shocked into action, it takes Edison two years to come up with his first home phonograph, a superior machine priced at only $40. Two years later, there's the Edison standard phonograph at half the price. Then the very next year, Edison brings out the gem. At only $10, it's the least expensive phonograph. But by the time Edison gets into the home market, there's a completely new competitor, the Berliner Gramophone, the world's first disc record player. The creator is a young German immigrant, Emil Berliner. In 1877, Berliner invented a telephone transmitter which is sold to Alexander Graham Bell. And 10 years later, he filed his first patents on the disc record player. Like most patent models, the first machine was rather crude, but it already had one big advantage. It was relatively easy to mass produce flat disc records, and Berliner came up with a novel way to do it. There was a button manufacturing facility called the Duranoid Plastics Company, and they stamped out buttons of various sizes. Uh, uh, and my grandfather said, why not press disc records? on the button machine. And so he did, eventually. Two years after the invention, he began pressing records, and they were five-inch discs. And interestingly, the compact disc that's so popular today is also a five-inch disc. By the late 1890s, Berliner has a better way of duplicating records, and his gramophone has a fine new spring motor. But in 1901, after surviving an exhausting patent suit, Berliner decides to sell all his assets to Eldridge Johnson, the man who made his new motor. Along with Berliner's patents, Johnson gets an incredible bonus. U.S. and Canadian rights to a painting titled His Master's Voice, which Berliner had bought in England one year before. Ironically, the machine in the original painting was a phonograph. The artist had offered it to Edison's British company, but they saw no sense or value in it. So for about $250, the artist simply painted a Berliner machine on top of Edison's. And now, Eldridge Johnson owns a trademark that will soon become the most famous trademark in the world. As the 20th century opens, Edison is riding his own wave of success. He's now in control of selling as well as producing his phonographs and records. Sales are up to more than a million dollars a year and the first golden age of the phonograph is underway. Thanks to long years of research by his team, Edison can now mass produce records. They're called gold cylinders because the process involves electroplating gold onto a wax master. In the coming years, Edison's company continues to develop better and longer playing cylinders. From the very inception of Edison's business career, he believed if he was going to produce a product, it had to be the best. From the very beginning, 
He was very proud of the name Edison. He put the name Edison on all of his products. And he felt if his name was on the product, the quality must be there. While Edison is consumed with technical quality, his competitors are more interested in satisfying changing public tastes. Early in the 20th century, Victor begins adding operatic arias to its repertoire and signs an exclusive contract with a rising Italian tenor, Enrico Caruso. In 1906, the Victor Company makes another radical change. In the early 1900s, all of the phonographs had an external horn. It was a very large, very cumbersome, unwieldy affair. And housewives objected, number one, to the looks of these horns, number two, of the fact that they protruded into the room and people constantly bumped into them, and number three, they were horrible dust collectors. The Victor Talking Machine Company heard this complaint and they addressed it. They took the horn from outside the phonograph cabinet and placed it within the cabinet. So now it became part of a piece of furniture. We now had the first home entertainment system, the phonograph, the internal horn, and storage area for records. Although priced at $200, the Victrola is an instant hit with housewives and their husbands, and Edison has to respond. His answer is the Amberola, a very handsome machine, also $200. But it plays cylinders, and by 1910, when the first Amberolas go on sale, cylinders are on their way out even if Mr. Edison doesn't approve. Eventually, there's a greater and greater demand for discs. Although he believes that the recording technology of cylinder is superior, discs have a lot of advantages. They're easier to use, they're easier to store, and so Edison, in fact, has to go and invent his own uh, disc record. To do so, Edison will be spending less time at home with his wife, Mina, and more and more time at the lab where his team has already begun work developing a disc machine and record. When Edison throws himself into the project, he often works around the clock. During the week of September 10th, for example, he puts in 111 hours and 48 minutes, a pretty heavy load when you consider that Thomas Edison is now 65 years old. As always, Edison's main interest is in the quality of the sound, but since he's deaf in one ear and can barely hear out of the other, judging sound quality poses quite a problem. Edison's solution is to sink his teeth into wood so that the sound can vibrate through his skull to his inner ear. In fact, the marks on the framework of this disc phonograph test model were made by Edison's teeth. In the end, Edison and his team produced the finest disc record diamond needle reproducer and playback machine of its day. In 1917, Edison has good reason to feel perky. Sales have reached an all-time high, and the future looks rosy for Edison and his competitors. But what they don't know is that the first golden age of the phonograph is about to end. As World War I comes to a close, Americans celebrate the chance to return to normalcy, in the words of the next president, Warren Harding. But with new fads, fashions, and prohibition, life in the Roaring Twenties will hardly be normal. Harding's successor, Calvin Coolidge, declares that the business of America is business, and Henry Ford agrees, rolling out a new Model T every 10 seconds. The energy of the 20s is set to a new rhythm, jazz. Beginning unsegregated race records, African-American artists like Louis Armstrong are creating a new American art form. Jazz records begin to cross the color line, and the phonograph begins to bridge black and white America. Americans are on a spending spree, and there's a tempting new product. Radio technology had been around for decades, but in 1920, radio becomes a consumer product, and broadcast stations pop up all over the country. Thomas Edison's reaction? He hates radio. For Edison, the technology was the key, the best quality sound. 
That had always that why is why he resisted discs for so long, and it's also why he resisted radio. The sound quality was so bad that he thought, in fact, it would be harmful to the phonograph, especially since a lot of the early programming was playing recordings. So here was something that was, in fact, diminishing the quality uh, that he had spent so many years uh, developing. Despite tempting ads, phonograph sales plummet. While Edison declares radio is a fad, his son Charles disagrees. One of Edison's two sons with his second wife, Charles had been working for his father for several years. Now he's the acting head and he argues that the company should start making radios like Victor and other competitors. His father responds with a resounding no. Every single action that Charles Edison took in the purported role as head of this company, his father had to sign off on it. And he ended up writing a memoir called Out of the Shadow, which really explains this relationship having to do with domination versus emancipation, a classic father-son struggle. The struggle continues and becomes more heated after 1925 when electronic recording is introduced. While Charles worries about the future, Edison is out and about soaking up praise as the great inventor and the most famous man in America. He also enjoys well-publicized camping trips with his pals, Henry Ford and tire magnate Harvey Firestone. He doesn't seem to have a care in the world. Whenever Charles can get his father's ear, he continues asking if he can get into radio. In 1928, Edison finally gives in, saying, I'm telling you, it's no good. But if you want to be a damn fool, go ahead. By 1928, radio sales have jumped to more than $500 million a year, and phonograph sales are still falling. When Charles brings out the first Edison radio in January 1929, he has little hope that it will save the Edison Phonograph Company. Nine months later, while Edison is in Dearborn, Michigan with President Hoover for the 50th anniversary of the electric light bulb, Charles is in West Orange preparing layoff notices. On October 29th, he sends word to Edison distributors and the trade announcing that the Edison Phonograph Company is no longer in business. That very same day, the stock market crashes. News of the crash dominates the headlines. And not until nine days later do people learn that Thomas Edison will not be making phonographs or records again. By 1929, Edison had lived a full life. He knew it. He was by no means finished. There were things that he wanted to do. But he realized that he could not be the commander any longer. Happy? I'm sure he wasn't. But he was also realistic enough to understand that this was the end of the road. There was nothing he could do to reverse the course that the Edison companies were taking. And it was a matter of turning his back and walking away from it. The 20s had been hard for Edison and his competitors. And in the early 30s, some people thought all phonographs would end up in the junkyard or in the attic. But their predictions will soon be proven wrong. In 1934, prohibition comes to an end. Alcohol begins to flow again. And the jukebox makes a grand appearance. Swing is in, and it seems like everyone feels like dancing. By 1940, there are 350,000 jukeboxes. Record sales soar as fast and furious as jitterbug dancers. Then in the late 40s, there's a major revolution launched by one of Thomas Edison's oldest competitors. Come 1948, the Columbia Company introduced one of the greatest innovations in sound recording. There they are, they came right back in and said, we're not defeated, <laughs> we've got an invention of our own. And of course, it was the long playing record, which was not made of shellac, it was made of plastic or uh, vinyl or vinylite. And it was a marvelous, marvelous innovation. 
With the new long playing records, the old problem of running time seemed to have been conquered. Listeners could now enjoy more than 20 minutes of music on each side. But the LP, which runs at 33 and a third revolutions per minute, soon has competition. The 45 RPM single introduced by RCA, which had absorbed Victor during the troubled 20s. Each of the problems Edison had struggled with were being solved, culminating in the late 1950s with a new level of recorded realism, stereophonic sound. Then in 1982, after more than 100 years of continual incremental improvements on Edison's phonograph, a truly new recording technology appears, the digital compact disc. In 1878, one year after inventing the phonograph, Thomas Edison wrote down a list of 10 ways he thought it could be used to make people's lives richer, better, and more enjoyable, including talking books for the blind. It was a dream, but the man was so far-sighted that in his own time, he couldn't accomplish what he really wanted to do. But in later years, Long after Edison's death, his dreams were fulfilled. The phonograph was Edison's favorite invention, and in many respects that may be because it was the prototypical mythological invention. It was the one that sprang from nowhere. And that's what made his reputation. The phonograph is what made Thomas Edison Thomas Edison. And after the phonograph, now the greatest inventor of the age, as he was called as a result of that, could in fact do anything he wanted. Looking back at the years and inventions that followed, particularly the light bulb and motion pictures, it seemed there was no limit to what the great inventor could achieve. Even today, the legacy of Thomas Edison is as amazing as those sounds from the first tinfoil phonograph. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. 